Hello everyone and welcome back to the Cozy Corner. My name is Lee and this is my library. So grab a mug of something yummy and settle in for some talk of books. Happy New Year everyone! Welcome to 2021. <laughs> it has been a minute since I've been on booktube and that is mostly because uh, I work a job in ministry, a church job, and the Christmas season, even though we're mostly online due to COVID, it's a chaotic time. <laughs> and so a lot of my passion projects that I like to spend time doing took a seat in the rear of the vehicle um, while I was working on those things. But we're back now and we have a lot of fun stuff that's going to come up on this channel during 2021. <sighs> I think it's a fair understatement to say that 2020 was problematic. And I think that a lot of people's opinion of 2021 is <laughs> them saying, everyone walk very slowly, don't touch anything, keep breathing to a minimum, and maybe it will be fine. <laughs> For the most part, I agree with that sentiment. <laughs> so let's take the lessons learned from the literal definition of 2020 hindsight uh, and make 2021 a better year. I know we can do it. Which is why I'm really excited to talk with you about what's going to happen on Lee's Library in 2021. Uh, I spent the past uh, couple weeks sort of ruminating on what I wanted to do with this channel in the new year. And there's lots of fun, exciting challenges and goals and uh, book lists and tags and videos and all of... There's so much. <laughs> and I will do dedicated videos to those in the future. But today we are doing something that I have... I don't think I've really ever shared this process with anybody about how I organize my bookshelf every year. I've said before, this is the only bookshelf I own. <laughs> this is it. Space is very limited. Um, each shelf is also two stacks deep, so pulling books in and out is a nightmare. It takes so much effort. <laughs> I do it for book list videos, but it just, it's so much work. <laughs> so that's why I keep out, I have a huge stack of books next to me. It's why I keep out all the books I've read in the year so that I don't have to continually pull out and reshelve books all the time because it would just take five ever and I would never get anything done. <laughs> so at the beginning of every year or at the tail end of every year, I will pull out all the books that I've read and I will put them in order on my shelves, um, basically organizing them um, to be shelved again. And while I do that, I also pull out all the titles that I know I probably won't reread or I think would be better regifted or donated just so that I'm making room. There's limited space. It's a tight system. <laughs> I've mentioned before that I really like to curate things and part of that is because I have limited space, but also I really only like to be surrounded by the things that I genuinely love and enjoy and are interested in exploring more of. So that's why I do this process at the end of every year, because then <laughs> mostly my bookshelf just sits and doesn't get a whole lot of action because it is kind of like a museum of books that I love. <laughs> um, very rarely do I reread things unless I'm super obsessed with it. Um, otherwise it just gets prime real estate on my bookshelf. So. That's my process and I'm going to show you what I do with that in this video. Now, the reason why I'm doing this is twofold. One is to do the regular process of sorting through what's on my shelves, but also because the way I organize my books is pretty loose. Um, it's sort of loose genre. They're separated into loose genres and then in those genres are alphabetical by author. There's too much librarian in me to do anything else. <laughs> um, I, uh, honestly, it bothers me. Uh, so this is an unpopular book opinion. <laughs> it bothers me so much to look at rainbow shelves and be like, those aren't by series or alphabetical by author. It, it bothers me deeply internally. Um, <laughs> they look beautiful, very aesthetically pleasing. I could not do it ever. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, the other part is that I want to actually be more in depth with sorting my genres because like I said, it's more like fiction, nonfiction, play, poetry, you know, that kind of thing. It's not like specific type of fiction. And I really want to sort it that way because part of the reason why I started this channel was to develop and expand my taste in genres where I know I have not read a lot. 
and sorting them by genre will be fairly indicative as to what I need to read more of. <laughs> so very quickly, because I want to get on to like the actual meat of the video of watching me sort through my shelves, um, I'm going to show you the books that I'm shelving and keeping and which ones I am regifting or donating. I have talked about many of these before, so I will just tell you the title and what genre they are in. And the ones that I have not reviewed on this channel, I think since I took my break, I'll give you a short review. Um, I'm not going to do any in-depth reviewing right now just because that would take five ever. So let's get into what I am shelving. Uh, let's start with the historical fiction, the adult historical fiction. We love it. I always forget how much I love historical fiction and I don't read a whole lot of it. Um, there are uh, three that I have reviewed before, so I'm going to quickly just give you the rundown of them. Uh, the first is Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil by John Barrett. Stellar book. I recommend you watch the, the video where I reviewed this book. It's so good. I read this one to fulfill the challenge of reading the most popular book the year you were born. I was born in 1994. This happened to be it. So good. Next is the book that I really wanted to give five stars, but I couldn't because the subject matter was too dark and I knew that I would have to be in the very right headspace to read this again. That's the only thing that kept me from giving it five stars. That is Revolution by Jennifer Donnelly, all about the French Revolution and two storylines moving parallel with each other set centuries apart. It's so good. Huge plot twist at the end. Romance good historical fiction, so much research went into this book. I really want to read more by Jennifer Donnelly. Definitely keeping this one. Next is Queen of the Night by Alexander Chi. Again, about France. I read a lot of stuff about France this year. Was not intentional. It just sort of happened that way. Um, this one, again, is historical fiction all about the Parisian opera set in World War One, And, or excuse me, <laughs> that's a different book. <laughs> this one is also set in the French Revolution. <laughs> Um, but more specifically about the Prussian invasion that happened after that and the abolishment of the monarchy and the sort of tentative beginnings of a democracy. It did not end up that way, but it follows uh, Liliette Bernay, who is a rising opera singer. This book, it, it, it takes you on a journey. There's so much that happens. <laughs> she goes everywhere. She's a carnival worker sometimes. She's a prostitute sometimes. She's a mistress sometimes she's a sex life sometimes it's really dark but there's so much stuff that happens in here this was really the book that opened my eyes to um my newfound appreciation for bittersweet but full circle endings because i think they're more indicative of how life actually is that was this book this book took up a lot of my summer um it really in the long run isn't the longest book i've read but it took me a while but it's so good and I really want to read more by Alexander Chi. And then the fourth one, which I have not uh, reviewed on this channel, but is so solid, is Memoirs of a Geisha by Arthur Golden. This book also took me a while, mostly because of the content. It just made me sad. <laughs> um, but it follows the story of Sayuri. Um, she is sold into the geisha lifestyle by her father, separated from her sister, her growing up being trained to be a geisha, her virginity being sold to the highest bidder, all part of you know, the geisha life. And I think more importantly, it follows the story of her living through the depression and World War II um, and the impact those things had in Japan. It was really fascinating to read about World War II from the perspective of a civilian in Japan. Um, even though this is technically fiction, it, it was still so well researched. Um, it's, I'm, I'm an American, so we hear the American side of history. And it was eye-opening and very enlightening to read this massive world event from someone else's perspective, from a huge hand in that world event. Um, the research that went into this book amazes me. Um, Arthur Golden sat down and interviewed an actual geisha. This is not her story, but it's sort of based around real life events of what would have happened in certain situations. It's sad, there's some romance, there's some humor, um, but it's hugely impactful. And I would recommend it to anybody who loves historical fiction. I contemplated putting this in my classics um, because that's ultimately where I found it was on a list of classics, but I think this is more historical fiction. So I'm gonna put it in my adult historical fiction section. So keeping those four, those are my historical fictions. 
I gotta find a spot to put this. There's too many. <laughs> okay, let's talk about adult adventure, action and adventure. I've reviewed this book before, but it is The Barbary Pirates by William Dietrich. Um, I'm obsessed with it. Um, mostly obsessed with Ethan, Ethan Gage. I'm sort of 50-50 about the sideburns, but he's just really pretty. So um, I really want this book to be made into a movie or this series. And I was thinking to myself, who would I like to play Ethan Gage? And part of me said Chris Evans, but I don't know if he's quite as swashbuckling as Ethan Gage. It might just be me wanting to watch a Chris Evans movie, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. But it was really good. Um, I actually did, learned a lot about um, <laughs> history, more than I was expecting, <laughs> um, particularly about the establishment of the U.S. Marines um, in the 1800s. That was incredibly enlightening. And I really want to read more in the Eighth Ethan Gage series. So I'm keeping this one. This one's going in the action adventure section. Okay, um, what else? Oh, let's just go here. Classics. This behemoth of a book. <laughs> Count of Monte Cristo. This definitely took me the longest to read um, this year, um, mostly in general because I started it five years ago and just never, fi never finished it. Oh man. I gave a huge in-depth review of this. I love it so much. I love the academia part of this edition and the questions and the insight that went into the story. It really illumined who Alexandre Dumas was and it just gave this story so much more life. I love it so much. Barnes & Noble Classics editions I think are probably my favorite because they are so academic and there is so much information in here. This book is so good. I would recommend if this is your entrance to this style of writing that you keep a pad of paper and a pen close to you so that you can keep track of names. <laughs> because <laughs> there's a gazillion people in this book but it's so solid so good um that's the only classic that i read this year i believe a little far behind in that one um okay next is adult fantasy Whoop! i've talked about these before it is the night of the word trilogy by terry brooks chronologically based on what happens in the books this is the first trilogy in the shannara chronicle series I am keeping these because I want to read more. I love the Shannara Chronicles. Austin Butler is so good. So is Poppy Drayton, let's be honest. She's so stellar in that series. Anyway, uh, but I really want to read more um, in this series because I do love Terry Brooks's writing. This is different um, than the Shannara. I don't want to misconstrue anything. This is still modern day world but all about magic and demons, and it's so good. I would classify these, it does say fiction on here, but I would probably go ahead and say fantasy fiction, just because it is all about magic and demons and that kind of thing. So that's my adult fantasy fiction that's getting reshelved. Let's move on to, Ugh. I've talked about these in depth before too, adult mystery, cozy mysteries, um, the Bookstar Cafe murder mysteries. I read all four of these this year. These, however, I am not putting on my bookshelf because these are technically, my whole family owns these books. Um, every Christmas we usually get a cozy murder mystery series, like, or new additions to a series that we love. This happened to be um, one of our favorites. And we've had these for a while, but I just needed to catch up. And my dad got the next two in the series for Christmas, so I'm already behind. <laughs> uh, they were really good. Um, Good cozy murder mysteries. What can I say? They were pretty quick reads. Um, nothing groundbreaking, but just, you know, good cozy reads. So these are not going on my shelf, but they are going in the murder mystery section of my family shelves. We're moving swiftly on to YA fantasy, which is just my lifeblood. It's my favorite thing. Um, <laughs> we read four titles uh, in this genre. <sighs> I have a few more that are coming that I haven't finished yet, but of the ones that I'm shelving, these are the four. I have talked about The Traitor's Kingdom by Aaron Beatty before. I am keeping this really predominantly for one reason, and that is because I thought this was a standalone book. It was not. I accidentally bought the third book in, like the final book of a trilogy and read it, and then realized at the end that there were two more that I should have read first, so I just read a huge spoiler. Um, and when I realized that, all of a sudden, all of these things in the book that I was confused about <laughs> made so much more sense to me. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to keep it so I can read the first two and finish the trilogy and see if that helps this book any. It was really good, though. I did enjoy it. Next is... I'm moving really quickly through these. Next is The Selection by Kira Cass. 
again, nothing groundbreaking. It was just a good read, and I really, really, really like the relationship between, um, oh, I just forgot her name, America, <laughs> duh, and Max and the Prince. Um, really like that one. Not a huge fan of, what's his name, Aspen? Don't like him. Um, again, this sort of reminds me of a combination of several things. I talked about that in my review of this book. I want to keep it because there are so many other books in this series. I didn't realize there were that many, but I want to read the um, sequel and see if I like it. And if I do, then I'll keep them and continue reading them. If not, then I'll probably donate um, this book. But for now, I'm going to keep it. Um, it was a solid story. Big shipper of half of that love triangle. Next, we delved into the Redwall universe again. Uh, I love Redwall. I will always keep every Redwall book I get because they are so solid. Um, I have not reviewed this one yet. Um, I don't know if I will, mostly because I don't have time. <laughs> but Redwall is so solid. I would recommend it to anyone. Um, this follows the story of Tyria Wildlow, who is an otter maid, and she discovers that she is part of a prophecy about the queen Hyrulane, who is an otter queen, to go and save her enslaved otter people who are held captive by a wildcat warlord named Rigu Felice. And it's all about her discovery of the prophecy, becoming queen, saving her people. There's a huge battle. Um, magic, the hilarity and beauty and poignancy of the Redwall universe. Brian Jakes just does an exceptional job. I think probably the thing that would maybe prevent readers from reading this too much. And it's actually a, a, a thing that I see a lot of that I didn't realize was an issue for a lot of people, but a lot of people don't like when authors phonetically spell out what a dialogue or dialect sounds like, if that makes sense. So they'll literally spell out what someone talking sounds like. Um, I, mostly I see it in like English accents. Um, whether it's a brogue or, you know, South London, where the phonetic spelling of things would be different from the actual, like, grammatical spelling. I think Brian Jakes does a good job with this, mostly because pretty much each animal species has its own dialect, based on English accents. <laughs> um, I think he does a good job because it adds to the character arc. Um, I don't know if that would translate well to any other genre, and I know that a lot of people struggle with that, but I really like it. Um, anyway, Hyrule Lane is great. Solid book. We'll probably give it a three and a half out of five. Um, good book. Everyone should read it. So it's not my favorite so far of the Redwall series. It's hard to beat that first trilogy, but it's still really good. <sighs> and then this book. The only five-star rating I have given in the entire year is Borage by Gil McKnight. This book is everything. It is so good. I have said before that I feel like people are too liberal with their doling out of fours and fives. I think too many books get four and five stars. So I overhauled my rating system and made it more cutthroat because um, <laughs> I felt like it was needed. This book is so good. It blew my mind. There wasn't a part that I disliked anywhere. It was so good. Um, this follows the story of Astral Projector, who is a fireside witch. So basically she's a witch who deals with the cozy parts of like home and hearth. She's an avid baker. Um, her house is so great. Um, I love the descriptions of her home. It's so cute. Anyway, um, basically Astral and her coven, the Plague Tree Coven, discover that their funds are being siphoned off by this evil magical creature. Astral is sort of sent as the scapegoat to Black and Blacker Finances, who handle the coven's finances to discover who this creature is. While she's there, she happens to develop a crush on Abby Black, who is the CEO of Black and Blacker, and much embarrassment and hilarity and romance ensues. <laughs> There's a huge witch battle, which is both the funniest and imp most impressive thing you'll ever read. <laughs> it's so great. Um, mostly the story revolves around sort of, you don't really notice it until the end, but it it's called Borage because this black cat on the cover is Astral's familiar Borage. Um, plays a big part in this story, but you don't find that out until the end. Big plot twist in the end. There's a few plot twists that happened in here. It kept me hooked. So I am uh, all about hunting down the sequel to this. I am going to stalk Gil McKnight and do my best to read more of what she's written because it's so stellar. This book came out in 2019. I had never heard of it before. It came out of the blue. So 
if you are ever around this book, please read it. You will not regret it. The last thing that I'm going to show is this says on the books that they're teen fiction. I would probably say they are high middle grade, um, mostly because I don't think they're necessarily stimulating enough to be like YA. But there are some deeper parts to these stories that I think would be a little cognitively, cognitively out of a middle grade league, but kind of in between YA and middle grade. But that is the Darkest Rising sequence by Susan Cooper, all about Arthurian legend. I talked about these more in depth uh, in another review that I did. So solid. Um, I am keeping all of these because they were gifts, but also they're so good. And I don't, I've never really read much about King Arthur. Um, this was really the first series that I spent a lot of time learning about who he was and the legends surrounding him and the kids in here are great. I love when books do justice between like kids being the main characters and the driving force of the story but having a good relationship with adults and like understanding that they're still children they cannot conquer the world. Um, <laughs> I don't like books that give kids more autonomy than they logically should have. Um, these books do a good job of reminding the reader they are still kids. <laughs> Anyway, um, these books were really solid. Um, if you like Legend, they're really good. There's some funny parts in here. There's a little bit of romance, not a whole lot. It's a secondary plot point, um, but it's really cute. And I loved them a lot, so I'm keeping these. Those were all the books that I am shoving or hauling. Um, and let's talk about the ones that I am unhauling, regifting or donating that I read this year. Thankfully, the stack is short. And thankfully, it's because it's not because I disliked any of them, like vehemently. I only really read one book that was I gave it half a star, and that was uh, The Missing Butterfly. It was not good. I read the whole thing, but it was not my favorite. Thankfully, that was an ebook, and I returned it. I'm not going to sort these by genres just because there's only five of them. The first is Above the Bay of Angels by Reese Bowen. This is a historical fiction. Reese Bowen is an incredibly prolific historical fiction author. I gave a review of this book already. Basically, I think I'm going to re-gift this and let someone else in my family maybe enjoy it because the content and the setup of this book, I expected it to be one thing and it just fell a little flat. There's murder mystery, there's blackmail, there's romance, and it just wasn't as much as I wanted. Um, it did not keep me on the edge of my seat. I was able to predict most of what happened in here. Not that I'm trying to toot my own horn but it just didn't give me what I wanted. It was still a good book and I love, again, all about France. This takes place in the French Riviera um, and Queen Victoria. We love Queen Victoria. Um, anyway, this is a stellar story, good plot point, or like good plot driven story, but the finer parts of it didn't really shine for me. So I'm gonna gift this to uh, another family member, see if they would enjoy it more than me. Second is Ruby by Francesca Leah Block. Um, this book I am donating because I don't think I'm the intended audience for this story. Not that anybody can't read it, but I don't think I got out, got as much out of this story as I think was supposed to be intended, if that makes sense. This story predominantly talks about, uh, Ruby's experience with childhood abuse. There is magic in there and romance and soulmates, but so much of it deals with her processing of her her trauma with childhood abuse and sexual assault and those kinds of things. I've been very fortunate in my life never to have experienced any of that. So I don't think the full impact of the story speaks to me, if that makes sense. I loved it and it was so impactful and the story was, again, sort of that full circle, bittersweet, real life ending. But I want someone else to be able to have this who maybe needs it, to need needs to hear a healthy resolution of this kind of thing, um, which is why I am donating this. Next is late elementary middle grade, I would say, which is Freckled Juice by Judy Bloom. I've got another Judy Bloom um, in the works at the moment that I am also going to be donating. There is a little library um, down the street from me um, that has a lot of kids books in it, so I think I'm gonna go put those there. But Freckled Juice, I haven't given a review of this I read it in 30 minutes. <laughs> it's very short. I would classify it as a novella. Um, basically, it follows the story of Andrew, who sits behind this boy in class whose name is Nikki Lane, who has a lot of freckles, and all Andrew wants is freckles. And then this girl, Sharon, who is like the definition of gaslighting. <laughs> oh, man. Judy Bloom. 
she was cutting edge on a lot of those current topics. <laughs> Uh, basically Sharon offers for a fee Andrew this recipe for freckle juice that will give him freckles and hilarity ensues um, it's uh, I mean it's Judy Bloom so it's gonna be touching I found this at a garage sale I don't have a whole lot of sentimentality attached to it I just wanted to reread the story so I will be donating this one as well the next one that I will be donating is when no one is watching by Alyssa Cole I was disappointed that I came to the conclusion to donate this one. I have not reviewed this one yet. It is an ARC edition, um, so there is a fully finished edition out there now. <sighs> this book follows the story of, sorry, I got a tickle in my throat. This book follows the story of Sydney and Theo. Sydney is a black woman living in Brooklyn. Uh, Theo is a white man who moves into her neighborhood and it's all about the gentrification of Sydney's neighborhood and the whitewashing that is occurring and basically the big driving plot point of this story is that Sydney's neighbors are disappearing. Um, a few of them reappear, obviously something traumatic has happened to them, but basically they're leaving without warning, no communication to their neighbors. Um, ultimately the whole thing that Sydney and Theo figure out is that this is a cyclical thing that has been happening for centuries and this just happens to be the latest occurrence of this happening to this particular neighborhood in Brooklyn. They, Sydney is giving or creating a historical tour of her narrative and Theo decides to join her in researching it and they're the ones who discover this conspiracy of what's happening to their neighborhood. <sighs> Slowly being filled by a lot of racist white people. So um, it's hard to read. <laughs> it's challenging, which is good. Um, gentrification really has been a topic that I have been really interested in learning more about. I live in small town America, so I don't really see a whole lot of that happening. Not that it doesn't happen um, in small towns, but this was a concept that I did not know was this prevalent. Um, and so that was part of my process of education over the past year. I was reading more about this. Um, this book does a good job of explaining it and showing how it is cyclical. This pattern of human history has continued to happen, stemming all the way back to the colonists and what they did to the Native Americans. Not great. Um, and like I said, it's very eye-opening. It's very poignant for today's history. Uh, it's a good read. However, the only part of this, and I, I wish that this wasn't the case because the rest of this book is so solid, the ending fell flat on its face. It did not do the rest of the book justice, which was really disappointing because this is a thriller. Um, it's got some spooky parts. This book would have most likely been a four out of five had stars had it had a solid ending, but the ending just fell flat, um, which was disappointing because I wanted it to be good. I was rooting for this book so hard. Um, I think actually though, to talk about the good parts. One of my favorite parts of this book is that in between uh, each of these chapters, they're in this neighborhood, they have um, an app called Our Hood, where all of the neighbors sort of communicate and talk about the events that are going on in the neighborhood. And in between each chapter, you get a little slice of the conversations that happen on the Our Hood app between um, the neighbors who have lived there for a long time and the new white neighbors who are moving in and the conflicts they're having with each other. And the further you get on in the book, the more uh, creepy it gets, um, the more conspiracy is highlighted um, in this book. And I really thought that was a really creative way to add sort of a background dialogue, an undercurrent of what was happening in this story. There is some romance, um, there is some um, trauma, there's a pretty decent plot twist uh, that happens towards the end, but like I said, the ending just sort of <sighs> fell flat. And the reason why I am donating this book, mostly it's because I want people to read more of this subject matter. I think it's important to educate ourselves on it. But I want to donate this and get the final finished edition because I've seen a few people review that. And I, I don't want to fully judge this book if it's not fully finished. Um, if that makes sense. It is an arc edition, which means it's an incomplete manuscript. So uh, I really want to do that and hunt down the finalized copy and see if anything has changed. 
So um, that was one that I read in the latter half of, or latter part of the year that I did not review, but I am gonna re-gift this one. And then the last one that I am going to, or excuse me, donate it. The last one I'm going to donate is The Last Voyage of Poe Blythe by Ali Condi. <sighs> I think uh, when I reviewed this book, I enjoyed it. And it's true, I did enjoy it. I think it was sort of a unique take on sort of post-apocalyptic world. I, I I have sort of a lo love-dislike relationship with Ali Condi. I did not like the Matched Trilogy. Um, I think mostly because she's writing in a genre where there are too many powerhouses already. Things like Divergent and Hunger Games. Um, even the selection kind of sings a little bit of that type um, of, of genre. The story was good. The concept of this book was good. I, it just felt too similar and I didn't like it enough to want to read more. If she has a sequel, I haven't heard of the sequel, maybe I would be interested in reading it. I don't know, but I think I'm going to donate this one just because it didn't really stick with me that much. Um, when I reviewed it, I said it was a good story and that's true. It is just really not one that I'm interested in keeping. So those are the ones that I am unhauling and donating. So those are the books that I have read this year that I'm going to be shelving or donating or re-gifting. So let's do some organizing of genre, shall we? Let's do it. Oh, I gotta move my whole setup. Okay, give me a minute. Hello, welcome to this angle now. <laughs> um, this is gonna be a time lapse of just pulling books off shelves, uh, doing some genre sorting. I won't bore you with all of this, but I'll let you know um, what I've sorted when I'm done. Okay, so we've got mostly every genre sorted out, um, including I pulled all of the stuff that was still on my TBR off the shelves just to give myself more room. Um, I definitely have gaps <laughs> uh, in a lot of stuff. And like I predicted, most of my stuff was YA fantasy. So I think the top shelf I'm going to make um, YA fantasy for now. Um, including I'm combining standalone and series together, which is something I haven't really done yet. Um, and then I think this, I think just predominantly the shelf is just going to be my YA shelf, whether it's fantasy, um, I have a whole lot of sci-fi, mostly it's Owen Colfer. I think the entirety thing is Owen Colfer. <laughs> um, and then, um, YA fiction and romance just to sort of keep all the YA together and then we'll move on from there. Okay, so as I predicted, YA spilled over a lot. Um, <laughs> um, I think now I'm going to do uh, middle grade, which I don't have a lot of. Like I said, just bunching all middle grade together, whether it's, I think I only have fantasy fiction for middle grade, and then the rest will be adult um, on this shelf. And then the lower shelf, I think, is going to be like all my nonfiction whether it's poetry, plays, I have a lot of academic textbooks from college, some cookbooks, um, like the comedy stuff, um, everything like that is going to go on the bottom shelf for now. Um, okay, let's do middle grade. <laughs> guess what? We've run into the problem that I feared. Um, my TBR pile will no longer fit on my shelves. <laughs> oh man. Okay, let me give you a quick rundown of what's on my shelves so far. So up top in the back we have YA Fantasy. Um, pretty much the entirety of the shelf. I think actually all of it is 
YA Fantasy with the exception of my one series of unfortunate events. Um, back here is just YA fiction, whether it's standalone or series, YA sci-fi. Um, we've got uh, way back in the corner my middle grade, um, action adventure, adult action adventure, um, adult historical fiction, adult fantasy, classics, um, adult fiction, uh, romance. So that's generally the lineup of stuff that I've got in here. All of this is not going to fit, which makes me very sad. Okay, let's do some squishing. I'm gonna quick put my TBR back on my shelf, see how much I can fit and how much is left over. I knew that was gonna happen. Okay, actually that's pretty appropriate because for my January TBR, literally everything that it doesn't fit on the shelves is part of my January TBR. Okay, that's better. All right, let's quick go back to our regular setup. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> I thought at the end of this video I was going to share with you all of the titles I still have to read, but I don't think I'm going to do that just because I don't want you guys to be here for an hour and a half, and also most of them will be in a lot of my TBRs for the upcoming year. So, um, yeah. <laughs> this was a big ordeal, more than I thought, and actually, um, now that I'm thinking about it, I didn't really run across any that I wanted to ultimately get rid of have a feeling that at the end of this next year i'm definitely gonna have to be more exacting in what i get rid of or i've been really wanting to avoid this uh buying a new bookshelf <laughs> a bigger bookshelf that will accommodate literally the uh 40 plus books that i have yet to go um so that's my process it really isn't all that exciting i just wanted to share with you sort of the thought that goes behind how I organize my books on my shelf. My plan is uh, later in the month to really do like a design overhaul of this bookshelf or bookcase. Maybe I will eventually get a bigger bookcase where I can do more elaborate stuff, but right now it's more functional and not very aesthetic, um, <laughs> which is a big part of the booktube sphere, you know, aesthetic bookshelves. And I really want to play with that a little bit. So maybe I'll do a video later on in the month where that's more heavily featured, but for now, it is function over beauty at the moment. <laughs> so thank you for joining me on my 2021 uh, revamp of my bookshelf. I no longer have room. I was really excited at the end of last year. I was like, ooh, I have, or the, like the end of 2019. Ooh, I have lots of room left. I don't anymore. It's all gone. <laughs> I don't know what I'm gonna do next year. Ugh. So let me know how you organize your shelves. Do you have predominantly one genre? Is it YA fantasy? <laughs> Um, are you incredibly behind on your TBR like myself? I really would love to know. Please like this video and subscribe to Lee's Library. It really does help me out and know, let me know what you guys want to see. As always, a huge thank you to the friends and family who have readily supported me along this journey. It means the world to me and I can't wait to see what's on the next page. Cheers.